welcome to Financial Insider Weekly. I'm your host, Michael Gray, CPA, and my guest today is Robert Temmerman Jr., or Bob Temmerman, who's an attorney here in San Jose, with Temmerman, Seeley, and Coleman, LLP. So welcome, Bob. Thank you for being with me today. Thank you, Michael. Now, today we're going to be talking about the situation, I'm the executor, now what? or about a state administration. And before we get started, we want to caution our uh, viewers to consult with an attorney uh, whenever you have to deal with this type of an issue of administering an estate. And uh, this is a great big topic. I've got a lot of questions here. We may not get through all of them. Uh, We can only hit some highlights. And also uh, bear in mind that uh, some people may see this who are not California residents. And so Bob is a California attorney. Uh, The laws vary somewhat from state to state. And so uh, be aware of that as well. So with that, I'm just going to go ahead and get started with some questions. So the first question, Bob, is what is probate? Mike, probate is the process of transferring a decedent's assets to the people who are entitled to it uh, under the decedent's will. Uh, or the intestate heirs if the decedent died without a will. It is court supervised. Uh, It is fairly time consuming and fairly expensive. Okay. Now, do all estates have to go through probate? probate? No, in fact, you know, in this day and age, uh, at least in California, uh, a, a smaller percentage of estates actually have to go through probate. Anyone who does any sort of planning at all Uh, can frequently plan to avoid the court-supervised process of administering an estate. Um, For instance, there are a number of assets that don't require any sort of probate. If the decedent had assets titled in a joint tenancy bank account, if they had life insurance with designated beneficiaries or retirement plans, those are assets that typically do not go through probate. Um, If the decedent had a trust, uh, frequently referred to as a living trust, or a grantor trust, uh, assets that are properly transferred to that trust do not require mandatory court supervision. Okay. Now, if the decedent had a living trust, does that automatically mean that no probate is required? Um, Automatic is the key word there. And the answer to your question, Michael, is really one of having the trust properly funded. If the decedent created a revocable trust and had effectively transferred his or her assets to that trust so that the assets were actually titled in the name of the trustee, the answer is no. Probate is not required on those assets. But we've seen more and more estates where the clients thought they had a trust, thought they could avoid probate, but in fact, very few of the assets were ever transferred formally into the name of the trustee. Um, and it's required us to do some maneuvering in a post-death situation to see if we can avoid probate on those assets. Um, but the key to any client's administration is if you have a trust, make sure that the assets that are intended to be inside that trust are actually transferred to the trustee. Right, and that means that you're going to have to, in most cases, change the title. Absolutely. If you don't change the title, you're going to have to rely on a court's decision as to what was the decedent's intention. Did the decedent intend to have certain assets in or outside of that trust? Okay, thank you. Now, a husband who had a will dies, leaving all of his estate to his wife, All of their property was community property. Now, in that sort of a scenario, is a probate required? No, California has specialized laws that make it simpler for administering estates of husbands and wives. Um, So for a married couple or for a domestic partner, for that matter, that has community property, we have a, a very simplified procedure. It's called a spousal property petition. It allows the surviving spouse to ask the court to confirm the assets as community property and passing to the surviving spouse or the surviving domestic partner. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, what is community property and 
why is that status important for a state administration? Um, there's really two parts to that question. What is community property? Um, first of all, we're speaking of a husband and wife or we're speaking of registered domestic partners. Um, community property is property acquired during the course of the marriage or during the course of the union um, as a result of one's time, labor, effort, skill. Essentially it's compensation. Property acquired with that community property earnings also is community property. Separate property is property that's acquired by gift or inheritance. It can be acquired during the marriage um, by gift or inheritance or it's property that was uh, owned prior to the marriage and kept separate. Now what's its relative importance? Um, for tax purposes as you know community property gets what we would frequently refer to as a double step up in basis. Nowadays it might be a double step down in basis with the uh, stock market performing as it, as it has over the last year. Uh, if it's community however Typically, we will not do uh, probate administration as to those assets. And even with separate property of the decedent, we can confirm that to the surviving spouse if the decedent had a will leaving everything to the surviving spouse. So in cases between a husband and wife or between domestic partners, we have simplified procedures. They're not full-blown probates. We have some benefits of to community property. Um, and a quick, easy way to get assets over to a surviving spouse or domestic partner. And I think the other thing that we talked about before was if you have community property, the decedent really only has control over uh, where half of that goes. His Absolutely. Share. You can. There are things called forced elections. Uh, I don't see them too often. We certainly don't draft for them. A forced election situation is where the decedent um, I'll use husband in this example, attempts to dispose of not only his half of the community property, but his spouse's half of the community mm -hmm. property, and putting the spouse to an election. Either you go under my will or you don't take uh -huh. under my will. You don't receive it. Yeah. Um, I, I don't, we don't like to draft that way. We certainly don't draft that way, but that forced election is still out there. But you're absolutely right, Michael. You can only dispose of by your will uh, as to the property that you own. That's half of your earnings, half of your community property, and 100% of your separate property. Right. Okay. Now, another thing that a lot of people are concerned about is what are statutory probate fees? They get a lot of hype in the media about this. Um, you know, are they as horrific as they say? Uh, and can any other fees, in addition to the statutory fees, uh, be charged? California has a long history of providing uh, a set fee based upon a percentage of the estate in administration uh, in a probate. Um, to give you a rough example, a um, $100,000 estate passing under a probate would be subject to a percentage of roughly a 4% uh, fee on that. And so that percentage goes down as the estate goes up. The question as to are they really horrific, well they can certainly add up and they can certainly be significant. Um, it's been my experience that particularly with smaller estates that the statutory, when I say smaller I'm referring to 100 to 200,000, the statutory fees probably are not sufficient to fully compensate the attorney and the executor for doing all the work they have to do. Right. Uh, in larger states, they probably overcompensate in many, many cases. Uh, and that's why so many clients want to just avoid court supervision and use a trust as opposed to a will to do their planning so they don't, they're not subject to the statutory fees. Um, and in larger, very large estates, the statutory fees can be very significant. 